Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of my TubeCast series, specifically this little mini series we're doing within a series all about the secrets of success that no one talks about. So the first thing I wanted to say is thank you to all of you who have been listening to the TubeCast. I realize that it's a little bit of a different sort of format here, just doing audio, not specifically video. And I really appreciate you guys sticking with me while I test out the waters with audio in this way. Now, I also wanna say thank you to those of you who have been listening to the TubeCast and specifically this series on the secrets of success specifically for being so supportive and open to the ideas that I'm sharing through this series. Now, this TubeCast is something of a challenge for me, believe it or not. Now, it's not a challenge for me in terms of recording and editing. You know, I'm pretty good at that, I guess. And it's not a challenge in terms of creating the content itself. In fact, this is actually a very fun and exciting process because as I've been doing my research into alchemy, metaphysics, and philosophy, I just keep having light bulb after light bulb moment where I can clearly see how concepts and ideas connect across many different disciplines. So to me, that's like the greatest sign that I'm on the right track with all of this because everything just makes sense to me, which is a really great feeling. But instead, the process of doing this TubeCast is challenging because I know that I'm exposing you all to ideas that are outside of mainstream thought. And with that, I realize that comes a sense of risk. I know the concepts I'm asking you to consider are perhaps strange, are things that challenge, you know, normal world views. And that's why I'm so grateful at all of your positive response and all of your support to these episodes. Even the questions and feedback that I got from the last episode, even though they were challenging some of the ideas that I shared, they clearly showed that you'd been listening with an open mind and considered what I was saying, which is really the most I could ask from you and is truly the best thing that you can do to get the most out of these concepts that I'm sharing because doing that will help you develop a stronger a stronger neural net. It will grow you as a person and make you a better version of yourself. And when it comes down to it, I think that's my goal in creating this series, to help you grow and in turn, that growth will plant the seeds for positive changes in your life. So let's talk about the feedback that you gave me on the last episode, because I'd love to address that before we jump into the second secret of success, because they're going to end up playing off of each other in a way. So I was very pleasantly surprised to hear that while many of you believed that we have control over our lives in many ways, there was still resistance that some of you faced in understanding why people would choose suffering if we choose our lives and experiences. And I was very surprised for this because I think it's a great question. And although I think that part of the answer will come as I explain the second secret in today's episode, I do want to address this head on right now before we get into all of that. So I can understand why it's hard to believe that we choose suffering because when we think of suffering, I think what comes to mind first is a sense of physical pain, but all suffering begins and ends in the mind. Suffering is only something we experience when our physical world does not line up with the ideas and desires we have in our mind, and we cannot reconcile or accept the difference. Yes, there are physical markers of suffering, physical reasons we might suffer like abuse, neglect, pain, disease, but the experience of suffering is a mental state. And it's a mental state that I know for a fact, when we take a good look at the world around us, we all know that people, Adults who should know better choose suffering all the time. When I look around at the world today, I see very many people choosing suffering in a variety of ways. To me, the suffering we choose to do at our own hands, like drug abuse, addictions, making poor choices for our health, and above all, choosing to remain in negative mindsets is really the worst kind of suffering for our spirit because we inflict it upon ourselves. And then, unfortunately, some people take that self-imposed suffering and turn it outward onto others. I think we in the U.S. are extremely guilty of this. We have so much advantage here and so much knowledge at our fingertips, but so many of us are miserable and often choose terrible outlets to ease that self-inflicted pain. In addition, I believe that suffering has a very important purpose, 
as part of life, and that is to help us grow and develop. Suffering is often our greatest teacher because it is the fear of suffering or the memory of it that often pushes us out of our comfort zones and towards our goals. I believe if this world didn't have suffering, we would become complacent and weak and never achieve much of anything interesting. It makes me think of the movie WALL-E, if you've ever seen it. I hope I'm not spoiling anything for anyone, but it is an older, older movie at this point. And part of the plot of that movie is that Earth has become so polluted that humans have to leave the planet while it gets cleaned up. So they board this giant automated spaceship designed to take care of their every need. Well, like hundreds of years later, they're still on the ship, and since their lives are very comfortable and routine, the humans have become basically useless blobs. Now, that might seem harsh to say, but if you have seen the movie, you probably understand what I mean when I say that. I think this is a very comical example of what would happen if we just got complacent and comfortable and stopped experiencing the pain and suffering that is part of this world. Because it's only through that pain and suffering that we can truly enjoy the contrast of all the good and beauty in life. So I hope that explains my point of view on suffering and why I think we do choose it, why it is necessary, and why, honestly, way too many people choose to suffer at their own hands and then sometimes, unfortunately, turn that suffering around and project it onto others. Now I think it's time to discuss that second secret of success that no one talks about. So are you ready for it? I hope you have a pen and paper to write this down and take notes as we discuss this, okay? So the second secret of success is everything is energy and energy is everything. Again, second secret of success that no one talks about, everything is energy and energy is everything. So I really love this secret because here we'll be able to really get into more of the alchemy, metaphysics, and hermetic philosophy that I love so much. Now, if you're hearing this and thinking, yes, everything is energy, I know this already, that's the law of attraction. I need to tell you now that yes, part of this secret is law of attraction related, but law of attraction is only one part of the greater impact of this secret. So if you like law of attraction, great, you'll love this discussion. But if you don't like law of attraction, don't worry, because the way it's often presented is wrong in my opinion. There is much more going on and much more at play for why it works and why it doesn't work and when you want to use it and when you don't want to use it. Okay, so before we get into all that, I want to start with ancient alchemical philosophy. One of the oldest surviving texts of alchemy that honestly doesn't even really have like a date associated with it, except to say that it's absolutely older than like 15th century, is the Corpus Hermeticum. And this work outlines the fundamental principles of alchemy. However, if you know anything about alchemy, you know the ancient alchemists kind of wrote in a code. They discussed their beliefs and the physical world in terms of metaphors, much of which has a heavy religious context. In fact, the reason the Corpus Hermeticum is one of the oldest surviving alchemy texts is because historical Christians thought it was a religious or biblical text. So they kept it safe all of this time. And that's why we aren't sure when it was actually written, but it was discovered as part of Christian collections of writing in the 14th to 15th century. And when you think about the world, or at least Europe in the Middle Ages, they were quite clever to be discussing physics in terms of religious metaphor, because this was a time when discussing anything science related that wasn't aligned with church doctrine got you killed. <laughs> so it makes sense why they were so secretive and why their texts are written like religious doctrine. But without a doubt, when you read through the metaphors, it's clear that the writers of this philosophy had a deep understanding of the physical world and were in fact able to predict things that science has only recently discovered. I do want to say, however, that although alchemists used religious metaphors to disguise and protect their philosophy, I do actually believe that the study of our physical world, either in terms of science or in terms of religion, are simply two points on the same exact spectrum. To me, and I believe to the ancient alchemists as well, seeking to understand our world and seeking to understand God were one in the same pursuit. I do not see science as an enemy of religion or at least to spirituality. In fact, I believe one day science may come to prove spiritual principles on an even greater level than it already has. The main point of which is that everything is energy and energy is everything. 
So let's talk about this and where it comes from. One of the main points of the Corpus Hermeticum is that alchemists believed that the soul of God was in all things and that God was the manifestation of all things. Anything that is, is a manifestation of God. For no one but God would be able to manifest themselves in such a variety of ways. And because everything is a manifestation of God, everything will one day return to God. And to get there, we follow a path of personal evolution back to our source. What does this mean? This is the essential belief that everything in our world is made of one thing, and that one thing is pure energy. Anything that exists is in existence because it's made from the same energy as everything else. Now, this is a concept that science has proven. We know from quantum mechanics that we are all made up of the same little pieces organized in different ways, and the smaller pieces are physical manifestations of energy. Electrons, neutrons, protons, these are the building blocks of the physical world. And the only reason things seem to be different or seem to be separate is because of the way those particles arrange themselves. See the periodic table of elements for this. It's got all known elements on it, and they are organized based on the number of electrons, protons, and neutrons that makes an atom of a single element unique from another. In addition, because we are made from pure energy, the illusion of separateness comes not just from the arrangement of the particles, but also from the electromagnetic field produced from the spinning of those tiny, tiny particles around each other. Now, this is where the concept of vibration comes in, because those tiny particles aren't just little stagnant building blocks. They are actually moving because they are energy. Electrons orbit around the protons and neutrons at the center of an atom, and they move so fast that they create an illusion of solidness and the illusion of separateness. Now, this can be a difficult visual to understand without some examples, so I want to give you an image to create in your mind so you can understand how tiny particles that move around can create the appearance of solid objects and separate objects. Imagine you have a ball on a string and you can swirl that string around and cause the ball to fly around in an orbit. When you move the string at a slower rate, you can see the ball making its orbit and you can see the string. But the faster you twirl it, the harder it becomes for your eyes to differentiate the ball from the string. Once you twirl fast enough, it will start to appear as though the whole orbit created by the ball and string is one solid object because the motion blur makes it look like the ball is at all degrees of the orbit at the same time. Now, if someone were to reach out and that ball was moving fast enough, they could feel a barrier from any direction that they touched at any point in time because the ball is moving so fast that your hand hits it no matter where it reaches in. But realistically, that orbit is created by the ball and the string, and it's not a solid object. It's two pieces moving so fast in an empty space that it has now actually created an illusion of solid mass. And that's exactly how our atoms work. Each atom of our body and each atom of every single thing in existence is nothing but a few little particles swirling around in empty space. If you, want, if you want to understand what this looks like realistically, take a look at the night sky or watch a model of our universe in space. Space itself, outer space, is a reflection of our inner space. A few solid looking objects floating around in orbits that have a bunch of empty space between them. We, as in humans, are just proportionally so small in comparison that we don't notice the movement, but the universe is moving proportionally just as fast as the electrons in an atom of your skin are moving. Okay, so that's energy and vibration, and I'm going to come back to this idea in a bit. But the second part of that philosophy is the idea that because we come from God, we are made from God, pieces of God, pieces of energy separated out that it is our nature, in our nature, to evolve to a point where we will become reabsorbed into God and into the whole. Now, this part has a lot of interesting implications that parallel a lot of science and religious philosophy as well. The first thing that comes to mind for me is the circle of life. We are born, we grow, we die, and everything, not just living things, are part of the cycle. But this isn't just about life and death, it's also about rebirth. 
Let's put this into scientific terms. Since we've already established that we are all manifestations of energy and energy manifests itself into matter, the laws of conservation of energy and matter say that energy cannot be created or destroyed. And likewise, matter cannot be created or destroyed. When we apply this to our life cycle, we were conceived and matter was transmuted from our mother's bodies to form our own body. Our bodies aren't formed from new matter or new energy. It came from matter and energy already existing and repurposed. Okay, so then we are growing. We are born. We live and grow outside the womb as well when we evolve to the point where we are essentially able to transmute energy for ourselves. Then we begin decline when the capacity to transmute energy to replicate ourselves begins to lessen until it gradually stops completely. But at that point, the story isn't over. That change is simply a change in the state of energy and awareness. Instead of our energy being focused on ourselves and our awareness focused on our point of view, the energy that can't be destroyed moves into a greater awareness, a greater potential as part of the whole until the next time when we again choose an individual life experience. And again, this isn't just about us as humans. Everything goes through this cycle because everything is energy. Science can point to the Big Bang as a point in history where all the energy and matter currently existing in the universe first began. It was all centralized in one point, one entity, God, and then it expanded out into individual pieces. Science also recognizes that one day the universe and all the matter and energy inside it will go back to one centralized point again. And there is religious philosophy to back this up as well, far older than science. In Hinduism, the concept of Brahman is the highest universal principle and awareness. And if Brahman is like an ocean that contains all things, mankind or individual awareness is like a drop of water falling out of the ocean and ultimately back into it. Hindus also have the principle of reincarnation as a major tenet of their belief, which again fits into this narrative that we all come from one source and will one day return to it. And yet we will again come for individual awareness because this whole cosmic dance is a cycle. Another scientific principle of energy I want to discuss that fits into this point very well is what is known as the second law of thermodynamics that states that if no new energy is being added to a system, energy is always in a state of depletion from the initial state. Another way that this is explained is that disorder in the universe always increases. Unless new energy is brought in, the initial order of things is always moving towards disorder. Now, I know that kind of sounds scary that things are always moving towards disorder, but really all that means is that all things in existence from their inception began moving on a tra trajectory back to the source. All the pieces of energy in the universe know they are the same. Whether they are a part of a planet, a human, a dog, a tree, a rock, they know they don't really belong separate. They know they are all one. They remember where they came from. They know the separateness is just an illusion. And I say they as though energy is alive and conscious because it is alive and conscious. Energy is the reason we are conscious and all things living or inanimate are made of energy and have a form of consciousness. We can look to science again to prove this, and specifically quantum mechanics. Within quantum theory, there is a concept known as entanglement. Essentially, when two particles entangle, they sort of pair up, and no matter how far you separate them across a physical space, whatever happens to one is then experienced in the other. So scientists have tested this. They have taken an entangled pair, separated them across continents, and when they went to measure one of the particles for a specific trait, the other particle too had the same corresponding measurement. Again, this is a weird concept to visualize, and I've heard it explained a few different ways, but the best real life example I can give for the way you might experience this in your life is the way energy is entangled between a mother and a child. If you are a mother, you've likely experienced a scenario where despite being away from your child, you had a sudden feeling that the child needed you or that something was wrong. Then you came to find that perhaps your child had been hurt or something else had transpired that you somehow picked up on. 
This is particle entanglement. As a mother, your child was made from you and your particles. And even if you, let's say, have adopted a child, you have still entangled your energy with the energy of the child. And so when the child is in need, its energy sends out a signal that causes a reaction in your energy and it's felt immediately. There's absolutely no delay between when the signal is sent and when it's received. That's because energy is conscious and in constant communication with each other. Again, I know it doesn't make sense to us logically based on our worldview that something could happen and instantly affect something else, but it does. And I'd ask you to refer back to the concept of inner and outer space. Space is an illusion. To us, outer space seems vast, and yet our own bodies seem solid. The ground we are walking on seems solid. But in reality, the distance between the particles is the same proportion as the distance between planets in a solar system. Now, the final point I want to make on this whole discussion of the evolution of energy back to the source or God is that because we are all made of the same energy and we are always in a state of change, technically it is possible for anything to change into something else. Scientifically speaking, although this isn't a mechanism we have complete control or understanding over as of our current technology, we know that it is possible to reorder the particles of energy to create something different. The periodic table of elements has an entire series of elements called the actinide series that are radioactive, things like uranium or plutonium, and even elements scientists have created themselves that haven't actually been found occurring in nature. These elements exhibit radioactive decay, meaning they emit radiation, which causes the atomic nucleus of the atom to lose energy and particles. Again, this is a concept ancient alchemists understood as well. They knew it was possible to transmute one thing into another thing. Most popularly, lead into gold, or conversely, an unhealthy body into a healthy body. Now, scientists know we have control over this mechanism of radiation because it must have been a century ago by now that they began experimenting with radiation on living organisms. So essentially, turn of 20th century, meaning early 1900s, scientists were taking salamanders and exposing them to radiation in order to get them to grow or regrow body parts in places they shouldn't be. So salamanders have a great regeneration mechanism in their body. If they lose a tail, for example, they can grow it back. So they took salamanders and started using radiation to grow heads where tails should be and a lot of other different stuff. So again, even though the technology isn't at a level where we can control outcomes yet, we know it is possible to use energy to turn one thing into something else. And there are lots of other examples of how scientists have used this principle to create things like genetically modified foods and animals and clones and things I'm sure we don't even know about yet publicly. Okay, so thus far, this discussion has been heavily focused on science and philosophy, and although I'm sure some of you may have already made some connections to applications of this information in your own life, I want to spend some time now unpacking how I interpret all this information for success in my own life and how I use these principles to get the results I want. First, let's address the elephant in the room, the law of attraction. The law of attraction is a concept that stems from the principle of vibration, that because everything is made of energy, everything vibrates, and vibrations have physical laws that apply to how they work and are controlled just like energy. Vibration is a side effect of energy, and like I said before, our vibration creates an electromagnetic field around us that energy uses to communicate and interact. If you aren't familiar with the law of attraction, it is what I will call a new age spiritual concept that has been around for a long time. It likely stems from ancient alchemical and hermetic thought, but through the years, the phenomenon has been discussed by different people in different ways. And the three most popular examples I can think of would be the book, The Secret, which talks about how to use the law of attraction. The book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which also discusses it, and perhaps one of the more popular versions these days are through the work of Esther and Jerry Hicks and the entity known as Abraham. Essentially, Law of Attraction teaches that wherever you focus your attention is what you will attract, because like attracts like. 
It operates on the basic premise that where attention goes, energy flows. You might want to write that down. Where attention goes, energy flows. And it is true where we turn our consciousness That is where we create because as we discussed in the last episode, you are in control of your life and your experience in life. And as we discussed earlier in this episode, you are a manifestation of God and made of the energy of God and therefore you too can manifest your energy as God does. So if you are someone who is always thinking about happiness and joy and you feel happy and joyful all the time you will only attract more happiness and joy. Or at least you will react in a manner in which you can only act on or pay attention to things that are happy and joyful. You see, Law of Attraction works off the science that we discussed a few episodes back when I explained the neural net to you and how our experiences in life build our neural net and our neural pathway. And our neural net is essentially our personality. As conscious beings, we are exposed to millions upon millions of bits of information every second, and we can only take in a percentage of that information through our senses. So there's information that we get from sight, smell, touch, taste, hearing, and of course, we have our electromagnetic field that senses energy and converts that energy into thought. You see, there's a misconception we have about our thoughts, about our memory, about our brain. Our brain doesn't actually store memory. Instead, our experiences pave our neural nets, which are intended to be like a blueprint for what to do and how to act in certain situations based on past experiences and situations. So our brains process and interpret information coming from our senses via our neural pathways, looking for the information that confirms what the brain already thinks it knows and understands, so that you will react in a known and predictable way. This is known as the reticular activating system, which is something often discussed in terms of the science of law of attraction. And essentially it means that our brains are programmed to look for self-fulfilling prophecies. But the system doesn't just work in one direction. When we are on autopilot, yes, it works in one direction. But if we take conscious control over our energy and where we pay attention, we can override our neural programming and start getting new results. Let me give you an example of how this works. Let's say you're someone who is sad for whatever reason and you recognize your sadness is causing issues for you and you know you would rather become a happy person. You can choose to focus your attention on being happy and you can actively start looking for reasons to be happy so that you can feel happy and then this experience will begin to get codified in your neural net. But honestly, if you're someone who is very sad, this is hard to do. It's hard to force your brain to see things a way it doesn't automatically see them. Something you could do instead, however, is simply smile. Now, you may have heard before that if you smile, it will make you happy. And it's true. It does work. It works because smiling is your body's natural reaction to being exposed to sensory information that your brain has coded as being something that makes you happy. When something makes you happy, your brain is wired to make you smile. But the system works both ways. Remember, when we are consciously putting our attention where we want it to go. So when you smile, a neural pathway fires up that is associated with happy thoughts and feelings. And the longer you smile, the more your brain is essentially forced to keep that pathway active and running that program of happiness, releasing chemicals that say, I'm happy. And eventually, if you smile long enough, you've drugged yourself up into feeling happiness without an external sensory stimulus. And now it's much easier for you to see things that make you happy and attract happiness to you. Now, it's not going to take away the sad things. Those programs are still there too, but you have to choose to put your attention and energy into the happiness system, and then your brain will be forced to look for a sensory experience to match the way you feel. Your brain will look for images around you that make you happy. It will listen for sounds that make you happy. It will start searching for smells and physical stimulus. And of course, it will also search the vibration of things around you via your electromagnetic field, via your electromagnetic field for things that are vibrating on your ideal of happiness and bring those things into focus for you. And you can do the same thing to attract anything into your life. I'll give you one more example quickly of money because manifesting money is always a big one for people. 
An exercise that is frequently used to help people manifest money via law of attraction is to have people write out like a fake check with a specific amount of money on it. If you're familiar with the story of the actor Jim Carrey, this was something that he did and talks about being successful with in his life. He wrote himself a check for a million dollars or something like that, payable to himself for acting services rendered. And like within a year or two, he manifested a million dollar check for acting services rendered. Okay, so how does this work? You write yourself a fake check for an amount of money you want. You can write it out for what you're getting paid for. And looking at that check over and over, day in and day out, your brain is going to light up a neural pathway associated with money and how you feel about making money. And then your brain will talk to your senses and start looking for money, signs of money through your senses. So you'll see loose change that you missed. You'll hear about money-making opportunities, but most importantly of all, your electromagnetic field will start drawing things to you with the vibration of that money. Now, not everything it draws in will be that check, right? Some things will be opportunities and you'll need to rely on your gut feeling, which is another way to say your electromagnetic field, to discern what actions you want to take on opportunities that you are offered. But that is how the law of attraction works based on the principle of vibration. Now, that is one way to use this secret that everything is energy and energy is everything. Another way I use this is by cultivating a high level of energy each day so that I have a higher capacity to get things done and be productive. Remember that second law of thermodynamics. Energy always depletes if new energy isn't being added to a system. So it's very important that we do things to purposefully cultivate a high level of energy each day. Remember in the last episode when I mentioned the true reason reason a morning routine is important and I said that most likely many of you wouldn't know the answer. Well, the answer is that a morning routine is important because it helps you cultivate an energetic set point for the day. However you start your morning, either intentionally creating a high level energy or not, that is the maximum capacity you will have for the rest of the day. So it doesn't really matter what activities you do. You just need to do something that raises your energy. And of course, the more you want to get done in a day, the more you will need to ensure that you have a high level of energy at the start and that you manage your energy well throughout the day. So it's not just your morning routine that is important for your energy, but also what you eat throughout the day to fuel yourself and transmute new energy for your body. It's important to protect your energy from things that drain it by setting up boundaries with people or activities that try to captivate your attention, like TV, news, and your gadgets. You'll want to have a plan in place for the day to focus on the top few items that are the highest priority for you by using the concept of setting your daily top three. And of course, you'll want to make sure you engage in regular self-care practices, and especially that you get enough sleep and as high quality uninterrupted sleep as possible, because that goes a long way in ensuring you have more energy the next morning. So there's a reason that you hear me talking about these same principles over and over, because truly these things each go a long way to help you manage your energy, which is in turn your capacity for success and manifestation each day. Okay, so now I wanna share a third and final way that I use the secret that everything is energy and energy is everything for success in my life. Now, fair warning, this third strategy or concept may very well make the least amount of logical sense for people for exactly how it works. But I definitely look forward to hearing your feedback and questions on this so that together we can really flesh out exactly how this works and how more people can apply it in their lives. I treat others the way I'd like to be treated. And I'm sure many of you recognize that phrase as the golden rule and perhaps are wondering why I think this strategy might make the least amount of sense. But when I say that I treat others the way I'd like to be treated, I don't just mean people. I'm talking about inanimate objects, plants, clothing, animals, food, rocks, paper, the wind, water, fire, literally everything. Remember I said before that everything is conscious because everything, not just humans, are made of energy and energy is God. So if everything around you, everything you sense in one way or another is made from the exact same stuff that you're made of and is a piece of God, exactly like you are, and conscious, just like you are, 
Really, what other choice is there than to treat everything with respect? What does this look like in my daily life? Well, it looks like I'm talking to inanimate objects all day long. It looks like I'm probably a freaking lunatic. But I swear to you, even before I understood why this works on an energetic level, I knew that the way I treated objects was the reason I am as successful as I am. Now, this strategy is completely predicated on the notion that everything is conscious because everything is energy and holds a vibration. So I am absolutely the person who is always gentle with their possessions. I never lose things. Things in my life, material things, inanimate objects, live a very long, happy life with me. I don't break things often. I don't misuse things. And I'd like to think that although I'm no minimalist, that my objects see use regularly enough that they feel important and useful too. It's been my belief for a long time that if you are respectful to things that you come in contact with, that they will treat you with the same respect. They will not break on you at the worst possible moment. They will not get lost. They will hold their value. They will work with you towards the fulfillment of your goals. So this is why my home is kept clean and nicely decorated. Because if I was a couch, I'd want to be kept clean, nicely accessorized, and surrounded by other nice things. Like, honestly, that's my goal as a human being, too. And as odd as it might seem, I know this works. I know that talking nicely to my car and petting it and keeping it clean makes it start for me in a pinch. And I've been known in the past to get vehicles to start that had broken down because the first thing I do is start to talk to the car and give it positive attention that it clearly isn't getting from its owner who hasn't been taking very good care of it. I know that when I've misplaced something, I've prayed for it to come back to me and called out to it and then suddenly found it somewhere I've already looked numerous times because it wants to come back to the person who loves it. I've received signs from animals and I've been brought gifts by the wind. Literally, the other day I was walking the dogs and I forgot a poop bag and then suddenly one appeared. It was blown over to me by the wind. Like, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt thinking I'm completely insane, but it works. Like it happens, I'm not making these experiences up. When you understand that everything is energy and that the energy you put out into the world is what brings you every bit of success and fortune, you just start living in a completely elevated way. When you see the face of God everywhere you look and in every single person, object, animal, in everything, you always feel like you are safe and protected and guided and loved and important. Honestly, I feel like I live in my own personal heaven every day because I'm surrounded by a peaceful, loving, high vibrational energy that I've cultivated through time and through practice. It might not be the easiest way to live intentionally cultivating and managing energy like this, but it gets easier day by day. So that is the second secret of success that no one talks about. I hope you found this episode and this content enlightening and inspirational and that it brings you ideas and insight on how you can apply this to manifest success in your own life. Of course, if you did enjoy this episode of the TubeCast, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with anyone you think would find it interesting. I do have a playlist for the TubeCast that you can go ahead and grab the URL to. I'll try to leave it down in the description and you can share that. That's probably the easiest way to share this TubeCast right now is through that playlist. And of course, I want to hear from you and I want to hear what your thoughts and feelings are on this secret and all of the information that I shared from the philosophy and the metaphysics and the religion, right? I understand that this isn't something that people talk about and people don't talk about these things in the same way that I'm presenting them to you. But this principle that everything is energy and that energy is everything truly is a example of where alchemy and religion and metaphysics and science all overlap. So I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts on this, your questions. Feel free to let me know what you think is missing from this, maybe questions you have, things that you can't understand, and I will be more than happy to address those in future episodes of the TubeCast. Okay, so for more behind the scenes of my productivity life and business, make sure you're following me on Instagram at Miss Trenchcoat. And if you are not yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button for more awesome videos by me. And until next time, bye-bye.